At 16 years old, Sasha decided that she wanted to try and make a little bit of extra money in her spare time. She thought she'd lucked out when one day she got a message on her Facebook offering her a job working at a nearby hotel in Blackpool. She would be working as a cleaner. Now, initially, Sasha's mum and dad were a little bit hesitant to let her go and work there. She'd been through a pretty turbulent time through her teenage years, but she was finally starting to settle down and started focusing on her future. And so both her mum and her dad eventually agreed that she could go. But this was on one condition, and that was on the condition that her dad would take her there and then pick her up after her shift was finished. This was all to ensure that she was safe. But it wasn't that first shift that they should have been concerned about. It was the second shift after they assumed Sasha would be safe. But she would suffer a brutal fate and her perpetrator had practiced just three weeks before. So he knew exactly what he needed to do to make sure Sasha would never escape. This is Red Rum, stories about the true victims of crime. Sasha Marsden was just eight years old when her family moved from Bolton near Manchester to Staining, just outside of Blackpool. Sasha was the youngest in the family and she grew up close to her siblings, but she began to push away from her mum and dad as she got closer to her school friends, often opting to hang out with them rather than spend time at home. She and her two close school friends, Angel and Beth, spent most of their time together and they loved the way that Sasha was always seeming to bring the energy to the group. If anyone was feeling upset or down, she would make sure to cheer them up pretty much instantly. It was in July of 2010 that Sasha and one of her friends had finished school and this friend was a boy who was in the year below her and the two of them headed to the nearby park. Whilst she was there with this boy, a 22 year old man approached the teenagers and he asked them if they wanted some alcohol. Now at this point, Sasha's only 14 years old and so it didn't take much vodka for her to be passed out on the floor. And this man saw this and quickly made his intention clear. He began to attack Sasha. He raped her. And during this attack, two women were walking past the park and it's a summer evening, it's about 8 p.m. at this point and so it's still light outside and these two women walking past can see exactly what's happening over there and they realize they need to do something and so they intervene. Now thankfully they did manage to stop the attack and call the police and then the police would arrive soon after and they arrested that 22 year old man. The police then brought Sasha and her friend back to the police station where the friend said he just hadn't known what to do. He was younger than Sasha, he was a year younger than her and he said he was scared and he knew he wasn't able to stop the man. He said, quote, I was too little. The police then called Sasha's parents and they came down to the station and it was there that they learnt about the horrific reality of what had happened to their teenage daughter. Because the man had been caught pretty much straight away and there were a number of witnesses, he was charged and sent to prison pretty quickly. He got five years and four months for the attack. After that, however, Sasha found herself unable to go back to life how it was before. As far as she was concerned, everything had changed and not only was she at that teenager stage of finding life difficult and pushing boundaries but she was also being bullied at school and so she just started skipping it to the point where her parents decided the best thing to do would be to move Sasha to a different school but that didn't help she was still struggling and she turned to rebelling to cope she started drinking alcohol and at this point, she's also starting to date different boys and sleeping with them. And on top of this, she's starting to self-harm. And while she would be at home sometimes, there were many occasions that she would run away for a day, sometimes a few days. And of course, 
this worried her parents no end and they would go out searching for her for hours and hours but when they would eventually find her Sasha would say she was fine, she didn't need their help and she just wanted them to leave her alone. It wasn't long after that that Sasha met and started dating a man called Danny. By this point, Sasha was 16 years old and her new boyfriend is two years older than her, so he's 18. Sasha's parents tried to keep tabs on her but she was incredibly strong-willed and they wanted to keep an eye on her and know where she was at all times so she needed to open that line of communication. But as had been the norm with Sasha, by the time she was 16 years old, she had started pulling away again and she just simply stopped telling them where she was going and how long she was gonna be out for. On the 31st of August, 2012, Sasha's parents became worried when they were waiting at home for her one evening and she just didn't turn up. They had agreed with her before then that they'd pick her up from wherever she'd go to that day, but Sasha had never shown when her dad had come to pick her up. And they knew at this point something was up. And so they tried to call her mobile phone again and again, and eventually it stopped ringing. It had been switched off. And so after that, they decided that they had no choice but to report Sasha as missing to police. Two days after that, they got a phone call on the home phone. It was Sasha. She told her parents that she'd run away with Danny, her boyfriend, and she was in Lowestoft in Suffolk, which was about five hours drive away. Now, of course, this was incredibly worrying to Sasha's mum and dad. They wanted to know that she was fine, but of course their daughter has run away again and they're sick with worry. They were concerned at this point that they could lose their daughter forever. They knew how much Danny meant to her. And so on this phone call, they said to her, look, if, if you come home, if you move back home, you can bring Danny with you and you can both live here together under our roof. They would say anything to get her home safe. And it worked. Sasha agreed after hearing her mom and dad say that, that she would come back home. And once she was home, it was clear to Sasha just how much upset and worry she had caused not just her family, but also her friends. Angel, one of Sasha's friends, later said to Sasha that it had obviously upset her a lot that she'd run away. And Sasha said she regretted it because she knew that it had hurt the people she cared about the most. Just a few weeks later, Sasha decided to start a course at the local college and she started this course because she thought it would help her, it would help equip her for a career working with children and on top of that she wanted some more independence and so in January of 2013 she told her mum and dad that she was going to look for a job and in fact a friend of hers had got her a job interview to be a cleaner at a nearby hotel. Now, Sasha reassured her mum that these work hours would work around her college hours and it would just give her a little bit of spending money. And that way, she wouldn't have to keep asking her mum and dad for money all of the time. She could do that herself. Now, eventually, Sasha's mum and dad would agree that she could go and do this job. But there was one condition, and that condition was that her dad would drop her off every day and he would pick her up as well. Sasha's trial shift was on the Monday, and so that day came and Sasha went in, she headed into Blackpool, and because Sasha didn't have the exact address of the hotel, the manager, which is the person that she'd been in contact with, he uh, was a man called David, and he agreed to meet Sasha just outside. Sasha's dad pulled up, dropped her off, and around 90 minutes later, he picked her up from the same place that he dropped her off. And when Sasha got in the car, she was beaming. She had made a couple of beds, but she'd not really done much cleaning. She just sort of sat down and had a cup of tea and a chat with David. And then David had given her a tenner and said that the job was hers. She'd done a really good job on that first day and he would be happy to have her work for him. The details were that basically she'd be working Mondays and Thursdays because that's what David needed her for. Other than that, she would just continue with her college work and socialising as normal. Sasha's first proper day was going to be after college on a Thursday. 
And so Sasha headed in as usual. And once all of her classes had finished that Thursday, her dad picked her up and took her back to that same area of Blackpool with the agreement that of course, when she finished, she would need to text her dad and then he would come right away and pick her up. But as the hours ticked by, neither Sasha's mum or her dad had any texts or calls from her. Sasha's dad texted her but got no response. He tried to call, but her phone just went straight to answer phone. Now, at the time, this wasn't too worrying because both the mum and dad knew that Sasha had plans that night to go out to a party with her boyfriend Danny, and there was no way that she would miss that. But by the time 8.30 came and went, and with no sign of Sasha, all of her family members were beginning to become extremely worried. Unfortunately, Sasha's dad had never actually seen which hotel she'd gone into. The area that he dropped her off in was a very touristy bit of Blackpool and there were almost 100 hotels in that area alone. Tracking down the exact hotel Sasha was working at was going to be tricky at the very least, but her mum and dad would try and her mum came up with a plan of how they were going to do this. Sasha's boyfriend Danny was of course living with them at this point and he had been at home waiting for Sasha to get home. So her mum went upstairs and she got Sasha's laptop and brought it downstairs and asked Danny to help. She knew if Danny had Sasha's Facebook password then they would have a real chance of finding out exactly where she was at. Now, Danny did have the password, and so she managed to sign on to Sasha's account. She typed in the name David into her Facebook friends, and up popped two profiles. One of these people was um, not the right one, they knew that straight away, but the other person had an address listed on their Facebook page and a number, and this was the address of the Grafton Hotel, and it had the phone number. So. They immediately put this into a sat-nav and they drove over there. But when they arrived at this hotel and David answered the door, he told Sasha's mum that Sasha wasn't there. He agreed that she'd been there earlier, but said that she left, quote, ages ago. And he said that she'd gone to meet her dad at Madame Tussauds. Now, this was extremely worrying for everyone because they obviously knew that she hadn't arranged to meet her dad there and there's just no way that she'd not get in contact with her boyfriend Danny and just completely ditch their plans and, and run off. So they knew that this was incredibly suspicious. They began calling round at both Sasha and Danny's friends' houses, but unfortunately they had no luck. And they also decided to look elsewhere. They went to different hospitals to see if Sasha had been admitted there, but again, they couldn't find her. After they'd exhausted all of the known spots and the people that she'd usually hang out with, they decided to eventually call the police. And at 11 p.m. that night, they reported Sasha as missing. Just two hours before they called the police, at around 9 p.m. that same evening, down a small alleyway on a residential street in Blackpool, just behind the hotel that Sasha had been working at that night, residents began to become concerned when they saw that smoke was coming out of the alleyway. And when they got closer, they realized that there was a large fire raging away. One of the spectators that was looking at this raging fire was the hotel manager, David. As the fire burned on, one of the residents went out with a bucket of water and attempted to put the fire out. They did actually manage to do this pretty quickly, but as the flames subsided, they realised that the fire was concealing a horrific crime. They found the body of a young woman. The police were soon made aware of this missing persons report made by Sasha's parents, and they knew that there was a very, very strong possibility that this body that had been found belonged to 16-year-old Sasha. They headed round to Sasha's mum and dad's house to take details from them, things like her appearance, what she was last wearing, and where her usual hangouts were. But whilst they were there, one of the officers got a message and he excused himself. He went outside of the room 
just a few minutes later, he returned to face Sasha's mum and dad and he told them that this time he had something to say. He told them that a body had been found and based on the information that they had just given him, he did believe that it was Sasha. As part of the identification process, they took Sasha's toothbrush and conducted DNA tests on it and they compared those to the remains that had been found in the alleyway. The remains had been so badly burned that they couldn't do a formal identification any other way and so they had to wait for that DNA to come back and when it did, it confirmed the worst. The toothbrush sample was a match to Sasha's DNA. The officers immediately went to the hotel to visit David and brought him in for questioning. They soon learned that David Minto was not the manager of the hotel at all. In fact, his girlfriend and her mum were the people who ran the hotel. David was working there as a handyman. David was a man who didn't really have any friends. He'd met his girlfriend online and if he wasn't with her, he'd spend most of his time alone. David's girlfriend said that she hadn't actually been at the hotel that afternoon and evening. She hadn't arrived back until around 9pm and when she got back she'd run into David doing some cleaning, which in itself was an odd piece of behaviour for him. But at that point he said to her that he'd had a nosebleed and he was just getting rid of the blood. But David's girlfriend also said that she had no idea that Sasha had been working at the hotel. She said she'd never actually seen Sasha herself and David had never mentioned anything about hiring a cleaner and it wasn't really in his remit to do so, that wasn't part of his job. Unfortunately, there were no witnesses around that time that the police could identify because it was winter and the hotel was going uh, and the hotel was undergoing renovation and so there were no witness accounts of anyone having seen Sasha or anyone to identify specifics that might help them in their investigation. But it would turn out that they wouldn't need anyone else to figure out what had happened on that fateful night. They recovered Sasha's phone and they found two text messages in her drafts. One was to her dad and it said, pick me up from Madame Two Swords that was odd in itself because they weren't supposed to meet at Madame Two Swords. It was unlikely that that message had been typed by Sasha. And the second message, which was to her boyfriend Danny, said, quote, I love you, tell dad to pick me up from Madame Two Swords. Again, suspicious for the same reasons. David's statement was that on that night, yes, Sasha had come round to the hotel, but he said that this 16 year old girl had made a move on him. And then he went on to say that they had had some kind of quote, sexual contact. And that immediately after that, Sasha started having a nosebleed and then she left. He said that as soon as Sasha left, he heard the door close and then just hadn't seen her since. Meanwhile, the medical examiner's results came back from the autopsy and they showed that Sasha had many defensive wounds on her hands and arms and it was a real indication that she had put up a fight against this perpetrator and on top of that they found 56 stab wounds to her head and neck and that she had been sexually assaulted although the medical examiner couldn't determine whether this sexual assault had happened while she was still alive or post-mortem. There was no real doubt in investigators minds that David had committed this brutal murder. They knew that for a fact, but they needed to prove it. They needed solid evidence and they needed to build up their case. They did, however, have quite an easy task of doing this because of the evidence found at the hotel. There was a huge amount of blood in the hotel, far more than would have been possible from a nosebleed. And on top of this, they found even more blood on David's clothes when they were searching other areas of the hotel, they also found some of Sasha's jewellery and it was clear that David had presumably attempted to flush this down the toilet. There were the backs of some of her earrings and a necklace. Unsurprisingly, David was charged with Sasha's murder and he pleaded not guilty and so the case went to trial. David was called to testify at trial and this time he completely changed his story. 
He did repeat this ridiculous version of events that he and Sasha had had some kind of, quote, sexual contact. But then he went on to say that after Sasha left the hotel, he went back upstairs to clean up that nosebleed that had happened. And he said that whilst he was cleaning and just a few minutes after Sasha had headed outside, he heard a loud bang downstairs. He said that when he went to investigate that loud bang, he saw Sasha just lying on the floor, seemingly unconscious. He said he didn't know what to do, so he just took her body to the bathroom and washed her. Then he wrapped her body up and he dragged her outside. But he said that although he did all of those things, he never set her body on fire. It came to light that the only reason David had told Sasha to come on Monday and Thursday specifically was because he knew his girlfriend would be working another job on those specific days and so he wouldn't be back at the hotel until later. The prosecution presented the case giving the timeline that Sasha had been killed sometime between 4 and 5 p.m. and said that after that David had moved her body to the bath he had washed her and then he had attempted to clean up the crime scene. It came to light after David's girlfriend had arrived home at the hotel, he told her about a, what he said was a mannequin that had been found in the uh, alleyway outside the back of the hotel. Now his girlfriend did come outside to have a look, but she said to him, that does not look like a mannequin. And in fact, David's girlfriend was the person who called the police to report this potential body. At trial, the prosecutor's key witness was a young woman who had been lured to the hotel under a very similar guise and David had attempted to attack her. This young woman was someone that David did know previously but that of course did not stop him. Thankfully, she was able to escape and when she eventually told the court that this had happened, it was revealed that this attack had happened just three weeks before Sasha's murder. There was ample evidence against David and unsurprisingly, he was found guilty of murder and he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 35 years. Sasha's sister Katie said, quote, the last time I saw Sasha, she actually walked me to the shop so that I could buy bread and milk because it wasn't safe for me to walk to the shop on my own. Katie, who is now 31 years old, along with her mum and her dad, they are now campaigning for David to have a much longer sentence. They believe that he should have instead been sentenced to a whole life tariff for Sasha's murder, which we've spoken about before on Red Rum. It rarely happens. But she said, quote, when you look at the sentencing guidelines, they state that he should have a whole life order, but it's not just Sasha I'm campaigning for. I'm doing it for all the victims who are children who have lost their lives because of sexual deviance. Hi, just a really quick one to say that. If you would like early access to all of Red Rum's videos, you can find details on how to get YouTube membership in the description box down below from as little as, I think it's like 2 99 a month, um, English pounds. Uh, so I don't know what that is in Australian dollars and US dollars and all of the other currencies. If you aren't a YouTube member, you will still get all of the videos that I make. Every single one, they'll just be out a little bit later. Um, YouTube members get them immediately as soon as I've edited them. So it's totally random as to when they come out. Uh, other than that, I'll see you next week for another episode of Red Rum. Bye.